Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator for today's WJE webinar, Cracking Me Up, Petrographer's Insight into Concrete Cracking. During the next hour, WJE petrographers Daniela Morrow and Carla Salashor will discuss common causes of concrete crack formation and will share case studies from their own experience. This presentation is copyrighted by West Janney Elsner Associates. And now I will turn it over to Daniela to get us started. Daniela? Thanks a lot, Liz, and thanks everybody for joining us today. First, we're going to quickly go through today's learning objectives. And uh, today in this presentation, we're going to go through recognizing some common causes of cracks, identifying the mechanisms that cause these common crack types, and then describe the benefits of material analysis and explain the techniques that we use to de determine and differentiate the causes of cracks. To begin, just a bit of background about me. Again, my name is Daniela Morrow. My background is in engineering science and geology, and I've been a concrete photographer for 15 years. I'm a member of ASTM, and I currently serve as the vice president of the Society of Concrete Photographers. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carla Salashor. I received my undergraduate and master's degrees in civil structural engineering from the University of Texas. I have been a concrete petrographer for nine years, and I am a member of the American Concrete Institute, ASTM, Association for Preservation Technology, and the Society of Concrete Petrographers. All right, so today we're going to give you a brief overview and introduction to what petrography is and a background look into a petrographic laboratory. We're going to go over why determining why your concrete is cracking, it, why that is important. We're gonna go through some field photos and lab images to illustrate the different crack types, and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So again, today we're going to go over how we examine samples in the lab and identify the causes of cracking, differentiate between different crack types. But I like to think that one of the real major benefits of using materials analysis and specifically concrete petrography when examining materials is that, yes, of course, we can observe features and we can tell you about our observations, but really we can then interpret those observations to relay to you the significance of our findings. That may help you to estimate the future performance of your concrete and really determine the significance of the cracking for your concrete structure. So let's get into a bit of background about petrography. Um, petrography originated as a branch of geology and um, it originated simply as a classification of rocks through the use of microscopes. And over time, we've adapted that into the field of concrete petrography, which is a more specific form of petrography dedicated to the examination of building materials, such as concrete that we're gonna go over today. And so we use the same principles and the same ideas as geologic petrography. We use microscopes and we just look at more materials than just stone. Our testing is governed by many ASTM standards, some of which are shown on the slide. And most of the time our investigations, um, especially with concrete, are governed by ASTM C856 and supplemented by other test methods. When we start to talk about the different types of samples that we look at as concrete petrographers, we really can look at um, sort of anything that anybody would like us to look at, whether that means you're bagging something on a site for a new placement or you're removing hardened samples. And um, I feel that it, you know it's appropriate here to point out that we're going to be talking about cracking in concrete. So if you're going to have materials analysis and concrete petrography performed on concrete to investigate the causes of cracking, you really want to make sure to include some of that cracking in the samples. So now kind of going quickly through how we perform an examination, um, we really use a systematic approach and it starts with background information, a review of site photos if we're not on site ourselves, 
and it may result in a quick look by a photographer where we can give enough information, satisfies you or the client, but we may need to go you know, many steps further where we, where we will begin to cut samples, we may lap them or put a dull polish on them, and then maybe go a step further and create thin sections, which I'll explain in just a moment. And all of this takes you know, quite a bit of equipment in the laboratory. We have, in each of our labs, we have multiple types of saws, multiple types of lapping wheels, different lapping or polishing medium, and really the different type of equipment depends on kind of the samples that we're looking at, whether things are larger or smaller, the amount of polish that we need to put on samples and things like that. And so why do we really prep samples? I feel like these two images really um, show the benefits of lapping or polishing a concrete surface. So here on the left-hand side, you can see a sawed surface of concrete. So that has just come out of a saw. It has been cut and nothing else has been done. And then you see on the right-hand side that we have then lapped the concrete section and really those features start to pop. So the edges of aggregate particles are crisper. We can look at the air void system and we can look at some of the larger features, typically using a stereo microscope. And so a stereo microscope is a, a relatively low magnification microscope that we can put any type of sample underneath. We use an overhead or a external light source to reflect light off of our sample that goes up through the microscope. And this presentation um, is somewhat image heavy, so we thought that we would show a couple of examples of what different types of images look like. So this is a lapped concrete section. And again, if you remember, so we're shining light onto the sample and it's reflecting back. So we're actually looking at the concrete structure. Here you can see we're pointing out some air voids, some aggregate particles, and then all the gray in the background is the paste. We will often go a step further than lapping a portion of the concrete and create what is called a thin section. Thin section is a um, a microscope slide of the material that we are investigating. And what we do is we cut a sample down to the approximate size. We impregnate that sample with blue epoxy. The epoxy really helps to highlight cracks or air voids, porosity in the sample. And then we, we bond that sample to a glass slide and we grind it to a thickness of 25 microns. So at 25 microns, we're familiar with the optical properties of the materials within the sample, and we can use those optical properties to identify and characterize what we are looking at. Thin sections are, are examined using a uh, slightly more specialized type of microscope called a polarized light or a petrographic microscope. It's a higher magnification microscope than a, a stereo microscope, and it actually passes light through the sample. So the sample, again, is 25 microns thick, and it allows light to pass through it. Again, we use those optical properties to then begin to identify what's in the sample. And so here we have an image that's a typical image taken of a thin section using a petrographic microscope. And so again, you can see that the blue dye highlights the cracks and air voids, and then we can begin to see some of the smaller features like the Portland cement, some of the fine aggregate or sand grains. And then at the top of the image, we have a large coarse aggregate particle that takes up much more than the field of view, but we can at least start to see it in this image. And finally, the third type of microscope that we, we use sometimes in our petrographic examinations is a scanning electron microscope. This type of microscope allows uh, significantly higher magnification and typically requires additional preparation or higher polish on samples, depending on what you're looking at. Um, Along with allowing higher magnification imaging, we can use the SEM to collect basic elemental information about the sample we're examining. So if we are examining a sample that maybe contains a deposit that we would like to further identify, we can put the sample in the SEM, take a look at the area in question, and get an idea about the chemistry of the materials. <laughs> 
Now I'm going to turn it over to Carla to get into the meat of our presentation. Thanks, Daniela. So now that you all have a better understanding of how exactly we perform our examination in the petrographic laboratory and what tools we use, uh, we'll now start talking about cracking and concrete. And so we'll provide a general overview of cracking and then Daniela and I will be presenting four examples of cracks that you may see in the field. And then the typical cracking mechanisms or causes that could be uh, resulting in those crack patterns. And then we'll show how we are able to discern those cracking causes from each other with our laboratory examination and specifically laboratory photos. So to start, we need to know why a crack formed and why that's even important to you. And the biggest reason is to help in repair design. So to determine if repairs are needed or at least needed at the current time, and then if repairs are deemed to be warranted, then we can help to provide information that will be used in repair specifications or drawings to help ensure not only an appropriate repair, but also a long-term repair. Um, also, our, our, our information from our examination can be used just to help mitigate future problems. And so we can help to aid in changes to future mix designs and maybe modify placement, such as time of day or techniques or methods that may be used for curing, among several other things. So we'll start with a general overview of cracking here. This is an image that's showing a lot of the different types of non-structural cracking. This image was uh, produced or reproduced in Neville's Properties of Concrete book, although it was originally published in a Concrete Society report in 1992. And seeing as that was 30 years ago, all of this information is really still holds true today. And that's one of the reasons why petrographers have been able to discern the cause of cracking for so long is because this information really hasn't changed too much over time. But this image is nice because it shows what cracks may look like and where they may appear in a structure. Um, and then that reference goes on further to outline the causes of the crack formation and remedies to those cracks as well. So we'll start with um, a way to categorize cracking. So this presentation, we will be discerning uh, cracking, whether it's early age or later age cracking, and that's primarily related to the condition of the concrete. So is that paste plastic or has it already become hardened? And that's what we specifically are meaning be between early and later age cracking. However, other petrographers and other grouping categories may be expansion or contraction. Um, and so that's one other way that you can group cracks together. So is your concrete material expanding and resulting in cracking, or is the material shrinking and contracting and causing cracking as well? Um, and then another way that some petrographers group cracks is whether it's an outside-in phenomena or an inside-out phenomena. And that pretty much means, is this exposure related, meaning outside in, or is there some internal distress mechanism that's going on that may result in inside out distress? Um, this image, the highlighted cracks are showing typical early age crack patterns. And again, early age, uh, we're talking about primarily plastic concrete, and that's especially as it's noted in ACI 224.R. That's the Control of Cracking and Concrete Structures document. But we're talking concrete that hasn't yet reached final set. And while most of us really think of that as in a couple of hours or even days, it really can mean within the first seven to 14 days after concrete placement. And some of the most common causes of cracking within this time frame include plastic shrinkage cracks and cracking due to thermal gradients, which I will discuss in a little bit further in an example. But you can also get plastic settlement or subsidence cracking and autogenous shrinkage cracks. And I, I wanted to mention autogenous shrinkage cracking here because I feel like a lot of people don't really, one, haven't heard of it, and two, haven't really 
gotten a good understanding of what that means. And so it's essentially a volume change due to the chemical hydration process. It's actually a self-desiccation of the PACE system that results in a contraction. And that can contribute to overall shrinkage of the material. Um, and that is an additive shrinkage to all of the cracking causes described previously. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit further, that there can be multiple mechanisms and they're all kind of additive to each other. So on the contrary, then you can have a later age cracking. And this is again in hardened concrete and some common examples of crack patterns for later age cracks are highlighted again Um, and just to reinforce later age, again, concrete is well beyond final set. It's beyond that first seven to 14 days of concrete placement, and it is sufficiently hard and has started to dry. And some of the causes of later age cracking that Daniela and I will be discussing include drying shrinkage, thermal cycles, and in-service stresses. And that in-service stresses term is really all encompassing. That can include chemical deterioration, weathering, corrosion, internal distress mechanisms, potentially cracks from errors in design and detailing, externally applied loads. That list really goes on and on. And we'll talk about a lot of those in-service stresses in our examples. So I mentioned that early age versus later age can be a good way to group um, the crack causes. And so I want to show an example of one way that we can differentiate fairly easy, easily the early versus the later age. And that's how the crack propagates through or around the aggregate particle. Note that this can greatly depend on the angularity and the composition of the aggregates. But typically speaking, an early aged crack will travel around aggregate particles, like you can see here in this image, because the pace to aggregate bond has not yet developed and is not very strong. However, a later aged cracks may pass through aggregate particles because that pace to aggregate bond has developed and it's a lot stronger. And I wanna note that that is one thing that can be observed on core perimeters in the field. And so if you're in the field and you have um, some water and can clean off the side of the core perimeter, this is a really good thing that you can look at immediately and start ruling in or ruling out some common causes of crack. Okay, so we're gonna go through four examples now. This is our first example we're gonna talk about cracks that you will see in the field that are typically transverse, transverse to the direction of placement or the direction of travel. They're typically narrow and they may appear shallow, although you may not really be able to tell their depth just looking at the surface of an element. Uh, and they may appear as cracks highlighted in the image here. And so some examples of what you may see in the field are shown. Uh, there's a parallel nature of these cracks on the left-hand image with a fairly regular spacing. There's a discontinuity that you may see in the cracks that you can see on the right. Again, you can see it kind of a discontinuity and a parallel alignment of cracking on the right image. And on the left, you may even start seeing some tear-like features. At this point, if you know, a petrographer was in the field or if you were to send us pictures similar to this from the field, we would start thinking about early age crack mechanisms. The other thing we really like to look for is what I call overlapping crack tips. So it means that that crack is discontinuous and the ends of the crack actually overlap each other. And sometimes you'll get a very fine, narrow crack that jumps between one of those larger cracks to the other. And those are called jump cracks. Uh, and this can commonly be seen in the field as well. So if we were to see this in the field, we would start thinking about early age initiation of those cracks. And so some of the crack mechanisms that immediately come to mind would be plastic shrinkage cracking, thermally induced cracking, and potentially settlement or subsidence, although that's 
somewhat to a lesser degree, and I'm not going to discuss that here, um, but subsidence cracking tends to follow the reinforcing pattern of your element. So if we look at plastic shrinkage cracking first, you're going to see a tear-like appearance on the surface of your element. They're typically shallow and narrow. They can be commonly parallel oriented to each other. Um, they can also be randomly spaced. They are intermittent or discontinuous along their length. Sometimes you may see those overlapping crack tips like I showed in the image. Uh, but the other thing to note is that Plastic shrinkage cracks are aesthetic and non-structural typically. So plastic shrinkage cracks are called plastic shrinkage cracks because the concrete paste is still in its plastic form. So it is not yet set. And so when you get evaporation of surface water from the exposed surface of your element, that exceeds the rate of bleeding. So you're losing moisture from your exposed surface and you're not replenishing that moisture at the same rate that it's being lost. You'll get an, a drying of that top surface and that will result in a near surface volume change. And that volumetric change is what actually results in the cracking. And you can have ambient conditions that can exacerbate your propensity for plastic shrinkage cracking. And that may be high winds, low humidity and high temperatures. And note, one of the best ways to prevent plastic shrinkage cracks are fogging or evaporation retardants. Um, and you can also have protection from some of those ambient conditions as well. So in the laboratory, plastic shrinkage cracks have a lot of those same features that you can see in the field. So we look for the tearing of the plastic paste, we look for discontinuities within the crack itself. Um, and we can look for things like I'm showing on the right, which is called mortar bridging. And this is where you have a thin stringer of paste that passes across the width of the crack. And that's simply due to the fact that the plastic paste is still fairly malleable. And so when it undergoes that volumetric change and it wants to, to crack, the paste actually pulls and tears apart. And so sometimes you'll see the mortar stringers going across the crack itself. The other thing that we look for is called mortar plugging. And this is when the concrete is cracking either before or during finishing operations. And so any subsequent finishing operations will smear and push plastic paste back into the top of the crack. And so it essentially plugs the top of the crack. So you no longer see it on the surface. However, the crack can still be there be below that mortar plug. So the other cause of early age cracking that I showed in those field photos could be thermally induced cracks. And we feel that thermal cracks really don't get enough credit. Um, and I'll discuss kind of why on the next slide. But the, the presence of these cracks greatly depends on when the stresses occur as it relates to concrete placement and hardening, the geometry of the element, the magnitude of your thermal gradient, and restraint in the structure. So while the examples that I showed had this, these characteristic transverse cracks, thermally induced cracks can also appear as longitudinal cracking and or be randomly oriented. Additionally, the crack widths can vary greatly. And as with plastic shrinkage cracks, these can purely be aesthetic and non-structural. However, I wanna note that for these two examples and for all of our future examples, if a crack isn't monitored and repaired as necessary, it can continue to deteriorate and it can lead to other distress mechanisms. So, Thermally induced cracks form when a th thermal gradient exists, such as when the surface layer of the concrete cools, but the internal temperature stays high. So for example, you have your heat of hydration from cement hydration within the interior of your concrete, but your exterior surface, your exposed surface is exposed to diurnal and seasonal temperature changes. And so you can get a, a thermal gradient that exists between your exposed surface and in the interior of your concrete body. 
And I want to note that you can get thermally induced cracks for both mass concrete elements and non-mass concrete elements. So just because you don't have a mass concrete element doesn't mean that you still may get a temperature gradient due to say ambient conditions. And in literature, that temperature differential, that delta T equates to about 35 degrees Fahrenheit. That's because that temperature differential equates to a, an estimate of the tensile strain to induce cracking in your concrete. And so if you try not to get thermally induced cracks, then you should try to keep that delta T less than 35 degrees. I will say I have seen examples where temperatures differentials less than that have caused problems though. And so one way to reduce or mitigate the potential for thermally induced cracking is to say use early entry joint saw cutting to try to relieve some of that pressure. Um, use insulating blankets and try to also lower the heat of hydration of your concrete. And so in the lab, a thermally induced crack may look like this, this is a polished lap surface. The top of the core is to the left of the image and the crack is outlined by the dashed line. And so that crack is you know, not very deep yet. It's narrow and it passes around aggregate particles. And I wanna note that it is often difficult for petrographers to see thermally induced cracks or at least differentiate it from some of the other early age mechanisms. So we really rely on observations from the field and ambient weather reports to rule in and out some of these other early age mechanisms. So I'll pass it to Daniela for our second case study. All right, thanks Carla. So now moving on, I'm going to talk about what we are grouping together and calling linear cracks shown on the image on the right here um, by the letter I. These cracks are you know, usually regularly spaced on your concrete element. So when we start to look at some field images, you can see that these cracks, they, they generally appear tight. They're typically about five to 15 mils wide they often have crisp edges and they may or may not break aggregate particles, which again, you may not be able to see out in the field. These types of cracks are caused by restraint, whether that's internal or external. Typically it's an external restraint, but there can be internal causes as well. And they may occur as full width pavement or slab cracks, like the crack shown on the left or transverse cracks in bridge decks or parking garages. In the right-hand image, you can see one of our petrographers standing on a concrete driveway that was somewhat recently placed. You can see that there are some saw cut joints, uh, roughly horizontal in the image, but then you can see that there is a nice crack running down the middle of each of these panels. If we take a look at some more field images, here we're showing a bridge deck. The left image showing the top side of the deck with the jumping crack that, pre that Carla previously showed. And then on the right-hand side, we can see the underside of the deck with deposits exuding from the cracks. And looking at these images, it may be hard to really take a guess at when these cracks initiated. Some may look like they have some features of plastic initiation, like tearing in the paste, while others may look like they occurred at a later date. So then when we see these types of cracks, we start to think about their possible mechanisms. Do they look like some of the early age features Carla just went over? Could they have begun early age and propagated at a later age? You know, these are all possibilities, but then they could also be related to phenomenon that causes global volume changes in the concrete, like drying shrinkage and changes in temperature or thermal exposure. So here I'm going to be grouping these two types of cracking drying shrinkage cracking and thermally induced cracking into what we like to call cracking due to restraint from global volumetric movement. And here on Neville's image, again, we're highlighting deterioration mechanism I, which correlates to the drying shrinkage crack pattern. But as, I, as I'll ex continue to explain, I'm going to more broadly characterize these types of cracks as due to restraint from global volume changes, which can include multiple mechanisms for the global volume change of the concrete. So let's take a look at these two types of cracking separately before we group them together. 
drying shrinkage is a natural process. It's as the concrete loses moisture to the environment and the loss of moisture in concrete is really a two phase process. The first phase consists of the loss of free water, which doesn't really result in much volume change. But the second phase consists of losing adsorbed water from the concrete, which results in a volume change that's essentially equal to the volume of water lost. This type of drying will continue until the concrete reaches equilibrium with its surroundings. And it will greatly, the amount of uh, drying shrinkage will, will greatly vary depending on the relative humidity on the exposure conditions. So you can imagine that concrete, say, placed in an interior temperature controlled environment may react differently than exterior concrete placed in an environment with daily temperature swings of 20 or more degrees. But at the same time, drying can be an extremely slow process, and often the drying process is slow enough, depending on the environment, that the concrete then creeps, and it re the creep of the concrete reduces the stresses that build up due to the drying shrinkage. And so in addition to kind of considering the overall drying shrinkage of the concrete element, you also have to think about differential drying within that element. So say you have a bridge deck where the top may dry faster than the middle or even the bottom of the deck, especially if forms are kept into place for some time. So again, I'm going to touch on thermally induced cracking. And Carla, Carla mentioned this and went over some of the features, but I wanted to reintroduce this again because like Carla said, there can be many mechanisms contributing to the cracking, and we want to remember that they can be additive, like drying shrinkage and thermal cracking. But in order to have thermally induced cracking, again, there needs to be some type of restraint. Again, whether that's internal restraint due to thermal gradients and temperature cycling within an element or external restraint related to something like structural detailing. Generally, the term drying shrinkage cracking is often used to describe what we're grouping and calling cracking related to global volume changes. The early age effect of thermal changes and drying shrinkage, among other mechanisms like autogenous shrinkage, are additive and we really should consider them that way. And really though, with these two types of cracking that we've grouped, one can really be more dominant than the other. Um, for example, depending on where you live in the country, say some parts of Texas may see a 15 to 20 degree daily temperature gradient, while some parts of Montana may see a 40 to 50 degree temperature swing in one day. Drying shrinkage may be more dominant in an area like Texas that sees lower temperature swings, while thermal changes and thermally induced cracking may be more dominant in an area like Montana where we see larger temperature swings. So when we get into the lab and we look at these samples, we really note that these types of cracking don't have a characteristic pattern or key feature that we examine for in the lab. Here in these images, you can see that the crack width narrows from the surface, which is to the left in that lapped section. It, it narrows from the surface with depth and it primarily passes around aggregates. And so then we think, okay, typically early age cracks are shallow, so this specific crack, maybe it started at an early age, but then did it continue to propagate? Why did it propagate? What was the timing of the propagation? And generally, you know, maybe how old is this concrete? When we look at another set of images, again, we see that there's no clear propagation pattern but we can begin to rule out different cracking mechanisms. So we think, okay, do these look plastic? You know, maybe in the left image where the crack begins at the surface of the concrete and it tapers with depth, but then we look at the right image, which was taken deeper in the lap section of the same sample, and we can see that the crack breaks an aggregate particle at the bottom of that image. This means that the, the concrete had gained appreciable strength when the crack propagated. So again, with petrographic studies, these types of cracks, they really don't have distinct features that characterize them. Instead, this is really an example of when petrography is used to rule out other crack forming mechanisms like early age issues or deterioration mechanisms that we'll discuss in just a bit. And this is also really where communication becomes key. 
you know, whether we're examining concrete for another employee here or for one of our clients like you, discussions about the crack pattern, a review of field images, locations of cracking, background on placement, weather conditions, and more are really key to forming conclusions of cracking due to restraint from volume changes within the concrete. So now I'm going to turn it back over to Carla for our third type of cracking. Great, so our third example are cracks that are typically horizontally in the field, at least for this example, and are associated with deposits. And what those may look like um, are shown in the image here. So in the field, you may see something like this, where you see horizontal cracking. In this case, you have deposits that are coming out of those cracks that are white in color, and that's evidence of moisture infiltration, which I will discuss a little bit more later. Um, and you can also see that there's some exposed rebar and there's some iron oxide staining. Um, Essentially, you have these horizontal cracks with deposits. Um, and another example in the field uh, may look like this, where you again have these horizontal cracks. Um, in this example, you again have two deposits, one that's white colored and another red brown color um, coming out of those cracks themselves. And as your cracking and deterioration advances, you may start getting spalls and loss of concrete cover to the point where you may be exposing embedded reinforcement that then can be susceptible to corrosion itself. So when we see this in the field, again, it may start as cracks, but it may develop more to scaling or spalling of the exposed surface. Um, and sometimes you'll see deposits from those cracks and associated staining as well. These are suspected later age mechanisms that may be related to freeze thaw and or corrosion. So if we think about freeze thaw, these again can appear as cracks or surface falling. Um, these are going to be most common in the northern portions of the United States rather than the southern areas. Uh, but myself being in Cleveland, I see a lot of freeze-thaw distress. Um, so for freeze-thaw distress, you need to have exposure to freezing and thawing, so hence the northern climate. But you also need to have a critical saturation of the concrete. And that means that the voids and pores are fully filled with water. And that's because as the water freezes, it has a 9% volumetric expansion. And that expansion, if unable to be accommodated by the concrete, say by empty void space, it will result in cracking. And so you have to have, one, the exposure to freezing and thawing and critical saturation. And so one of the best ways to mitigate against freeze-thaw distress is a proper air void system. And a proper air void system means more than just the total air content of the concrete. It also means the size and the spacing of the air voids. And that's something that petrographers can measure for hardened concrete samples by running a modified point count study. And that's dictated by ASTM C457. And I wanna note that historically, that has been the only way to get the properties of the air void system is by running that C457 test. However, there's been a new technological development with the super air meter that a lot of DOTs have started adopting. And that is a way to get these parameters in plastic unset concrete. So you wouldn't have to wait until the material was hardened and then take a core sample and then send it into the lab for analysis. So freeze-thaw cracking, luckily for petrographers, is extremely characteristic. So we look for cracks that are parallel to each other and often parallel to the exterior surface. And those cracks pass through paste and aggregate particles. You can see what we would see under the microscope in these images here. As I mentioned, the air void content is one excellent way to mitigate against freeze-thaw damage. Um, 
as I mentioned, it's not solely just total air void content, but the size and the spacing as well. But just to show you what varying levels of air content look like on a hardened concrete sample, uh, a lower volume of air on the left and a higher volume of air on the right. Air will look like black spaces in those images because we like to use low angle reflected lighting for that analysis. The other thing I mentioned was that freeze thaw has to have critical saturation of your concrete. And so we look for anything that would indicate moisture migration. And often that is deposits in your air voids. In this example, we are looking for etrinite deposits. Those will look white just on a lap surface. You can see in the left image, but we can use chemical reagents that will stain etrinite orange. This particular example is alizarin red S dye. And so all of those white deposits in the voids are stained orange now. And that's one method that petrographers can use to identify the composition of those deposits. The other mechanism that may be at play is corrosion induced cracking. And this is typically oriented with the reinforcement and is often accompanied by rust staining, that uh, red-brown iron oxide staining. And so these cracks are due to corrosion of embedded reinforcement, and that may be due to carbonation of the paste. So as the paste pH lowers, you lose that natural passivation on your embedded uncoated reinforcement. And so you may get carbonation-induced corrosion you could also get chloride-induced corrosion, which I think is um, most common and most what most people think of initially, especially with the use of chloride de-icing salts. But you can also get dissimilar metal corrosion as well. Um, one of the ways to prevent corrosion-induced cracking is one, don't let moisture and or chlorides get into your concrete. And also don't use chloride-containing materials such as admixtures and de-icing salts. So corrosion can be very easy to identify if your core sample has intersected reinforcement, especially if that reinforcement is showing signs of corrosion already, whether that's iron oxide staining or section lost. But if you have a core sample that does not intersect reinforcement and so you don't get some of those features, it can be, be very difficult to rule in corrosion as the mechanism at play. Um, for this example that I'm showing here, it's the same project where we got multiple samples. So the sample on the top intersected reinforcement that had visible corrosion and cracking. The sample on the bottom did not intersect reinforcement. However, when you line those cores up next to each other, the cracking in that bottom core aligned very well with the known locations of reinforcement. And so while we didn't have any specific features indicating corrosion solely in that bottom core, we can still say with pretty good certainty that those cracks are likely corrosion related. And so this is what may look, it may look like under the microscope to see some of that red brown rust scale either along the embedded reinforcement or along the cracks that may start forming as well. I'll hand it to Daniela for our last example. All right, thanks again, Carla. So I'm going to close out today going over what we are calling map cracking, highlighted here on Neville's image with a few different um, types, of, a few different figures. And these types of cracks are often also called pattern cracking. So when you're out in the field, you can see this type of cracking on really any type of concrete element, whether it's horizontal or vertical or anywhere in between. And here, these cracks are highlighted by moisture. I want to point out this field work was done. You can see that everything was wet. So these are not actually deposits coming out of these cracks in particular, but you can really see that map cracking pattern again, that's highlighted by the moisture. Looking at a couple more images, these are closer up. You can see, okay, there's some multiple sides exposed, there's map cracking, and then you start to think, all right, what could be causing this cracking? So in some cases, you may see staining or again, moisture around the cracking and looking at the pattern, you start to think, all right, when did this initiate? It looks like it initiated at a later age. 
the exception to this rule being crazed cracking or shallow, uh, shallow cracks that form typically on horizontal surfaces that are receiving a trowel finish. The surface is allowed to dry out and these cracks really only penetrate a couple of millimeters. But on exterior or even interior elements, we start to think about, okay, these cracking, this map cracking may be a sign of some possible deterioration mechanisms such as ASR or alkali silica reactivity or DEF or delayed ettringite formation. So we'll start with ASR, which is highlighted by the letter M on this figure. And really we'll get into what causes them. There's three major components that are necessary for ASR and then for cracking to result. You need a reactive form of silica, which is typically going to come from your aggregate particles. You need a source of sufficient alkalis for the reaction, which is typically going to come from the Portland cement. And then you need a source of moisture to fuel the reaction. What happens is the silica reacts with the alkalis and it forms what we call ASR gel. This ASR gel is hygroscopic, it means it loves water, so any moisture that is around, it's going to imbibe into its structure, swell, and eventually cause cracking. There are many, many ways to mitigate ASR. You can use supplementary cementitious materials, you can use non-reactive aggregates, you can limit moisture exposure, and again, these they can be structurally significant depending really on the severity of the reaction, the severity of the cracking, and the type of element that is exhibiting cracking. And again, luckily for us uh, as petrographers, ASR has some pretty characteristic features, namely ASR gel. So in this left-hand image, I'm showing some dried ASR gel on a piece of concrete that we broke here in the lab. And you can see that in the middle of that white mass, there is an aggregate particle that is the reactive aggregate particle. On the right-hand side, you can see on a lap section of concrete that there's an aggregate particle. It appears internally cracked, like something is going on with that aggregate. When we look at it in thin section using a polarized light microscope on the left-hand side, you can see again that the blue dye is highlighting the cracking within that aggregate particle. But really, we can see other types of aggregate particles that crack and they, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's alkali silica reactivity going on. We need to find that ASR gel. So in the right-hand image, there is a crack that is partially filled with blue dyed epoxy and where the red arrows are pointing, there's no blue dyed epoxy because it is filled with ASR gel. So there's confirmation that in this concrete that there was ASR going on. Now we'll move on to DEF, which I've also highlighted with the letter M and Neville doesn't actually include this on the diagram because this is one of kind of the rarer types of cracking that we deal with. And really delayed ettringite formation is a type of in, internal sulfate attack versus external sulfate attack. To take a step back, ettringite is a hydration product of Portland cement. It forms in all concrete as the cement hydrates and it lives within the concrete with no deleterious effects typically. But if concrete reaches too high of a temperature during curing, typical ettringite formation is delayed, hence the name. The high heats can be due to elevated temperatures from heat of hydration in mass concrete placements. If thermal control plans are not in place or if they fail, or the other time that we see delayed ettringite formation is in precast applications where steam curing is done at uncontrolled temperatures or too high of temperatures. So those are really two of the, the major times that we see delayed ettringite formation. And in general, maximum temperature recommendations and regulations for curing temperatures of concrete, they may slightly vary by agency, state, project specifications, but it's typically kept to below 158 degrees Fahrenheit or 70 degrees Celsius to minimize for the potential for delayed ettringite formation and deleterious expansion resulting from the delayed ettringite formation. If supplementary cementitious materials are used in the mix, higher temperatures may be permitted. And there are some other factors um, other than the curing temperature that play a role in delayed ethanite formation. That, that includes the cement chemistry, really the alkali content of the concrete, and again, the presence or absence of these supplementary cementitious materials. And DEF is one of those um, deterioration mechanisms that, you know, it occurs because 
ettringite formation is interrupted by those high temperatures. So you're going to get that ettringite formation at a later date, causing expansion in the concrete. But lucky for us, again, because of the type of reaction, it has some pretty characteristic features that we look for in a petrographic examination. Because the ettringite is growing in the hardened concrete after it has set, there's no room for it. So it's causing a bulk paste expansion, and the paste is pulling away from the aggregate particles. That results in these separation fractures around aggregate particles. We call them racetracks around aggregates that then fill with deposits of ettringite. But I do want to point out that these deposits of ettringite typically in these types of cracks are not what's causing the expansion. It's really ettringite that's growing within the cement paste that might be too small for us to see optically that's causing the expansion. And then when moisture gets into the concrete, the ettringite is is dissolved and reprecipitated into the void space into the and the cracks that are around aggregate particles. And so this is one of the types of deterioration mechanisms that we often use scanning electron microscopy for, and these are SEM images. And we really we use the SEM to examine the, the finer scale microcracking pattern, verify the composition of the deposits, and really look for those ettringite. Um, nests growing within the paste because, again, those are often too small for us to see using an optical microscope. And then, of course, like I mentioned, we can get some elemental information and look for the, the um, chemical signature for ettringite, which is a calcium sulfur illuminate shown um, in the bottom of that left image. All right, now I'm going to turn it back over to Carla to wrap things up for us. Right, thank you. So in summary, there are many different mechanisms of crack formation uh, that are non-structural like we've discussed today and many more when you start considering structural cracking. And then to complicate matters even further, a lot of these mechanisms can affect a structure at the same time and over its service life. And sometimes there's a primary cause of cracking and other secondary causes, meaning that maybe something initiated the cracks and opened up that concrete that then became more susceptible to some of these secondary mechanisms. And sometimes as petrographers, we're able to make that differentiation, and other times we are not. But luckily, a lot of these cracks have a fingerprint that we can use to differentiate them from one another in the laboratory. Um, so we look for the specific crack pattern um, under the microscope and using all of these different techniques to differentiate these mechanisms from one another. Again, as Daniela showed, we use a lot of different microscopes. We have chemical testing, we have different lighting conditions, all that we use as part of our examinations. And sometimes it's a quick answer and sometimes it can take a lot of testing to try to determine that cause. However, if in doubt, feel free to send a sample for examination. So to conclude, finally, when should you worry? So performing a petrographic examination really helps you understand the nature of the problem better. So then you can assess your own risk. So everyone in every project will have a different risk profile. So it's kind of hard to have a blanket answer for this question. So let's say one structure may need to have a service life of 50 years, but one only needs to last one more year until repairs are included in, in the budget. Um, so those are gonna have very different risk profiles when talking about each of those um, projects. Additionally, we can help to determine if the project or the problem is associated with one truckload of concrete, maybe one day's worth of concrete, or potentially the entire structure. And so this would be a decision where you would have to make as to the benefit and cost of performing that examination versus the magnitude of the affected area. And then the other thing people don't consider is what's the cost associated with not making a decision at that time or delaying that decision. Those are all aspects that would go into uh, if you should worry, if you should get a petrographer involved, uh, if you should take core samples and have us just take a look. Um, but we are available for any questions on specific projects or as it relates to this um, this presentation. And so we'd like to open up um, now for questions if you want to type them in the Q&A box. Thanks, Carla. 
And like Carla mentioned, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box and hit submit. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible uh, before the end of the hour. But if we aren't able to get to your question during the live call, Carla or Daniela will follow up with you afterward. Okay, let's take our first question. What kind of tools do you recommend us taking into the field for an examination? All right, I love this question. Um, so as petrographers, we occasionally get to go out in the field, um, but often we are looking under the microscopes in the lab. And so we often advise engineers and architects of what tools they can take um, to try to give us as much information in the field as possible. Uh, we do like to have as many pictures, um, but there are some techniques that you can use as well. Um, one thing, it would be a hand loop, and some of these have um, built-in illumination, and some of them do not. Um, if you have your, your camera on, you can see, I'll show what one looks like. Typically, we're talking 10 or 25x. Um, the other thing we like is a flashlight, so you can change the angle of illumination and you can try to see things like surface relief. Um, that's really helpful. Also a crack card to try to measure your concrete widths. Um, field microscopes, there are a lot of great cheap field microscopes um, out right now. We also like to have them take steel or copper probes. Just you take copper wire and make a, a sharp point on the end. That's a good way to assess pace hardness. We also prefer to have people take um, some water and water drop tests on the surface to see things like absorptivity as well. All right, our next question. How is autogenous shrinkage different to plastic shrinkage cracking? Um, I can take this one. Um, so they're both early age shrinkage mechanisms. However, um, plastic shrinkage is really rapid and excessive moisture loss from the surface, um, primarily because of evaporation. And autogenous shrinkage is a result of chemical reactions between the cement and water upon um, those mixing and hydration starting. All right, our next question. Would plastic shrinkage cracks be the cause of alligator cracking? Um, I could take um, this one. So okay. um, I think maybe we're talking about craze cracking or, or alligator cracking. And so that is a plastic phenomenon where the top surface of the concrete is drying out faster than bleed water um, can replenish it can happen you know, with um, low humidity days, wind, or in interior environments if that concrete surface isn't protected. So it is a plastic or an early age phenomenon when you see craze cracking. It can also be seen in reinforced concrete structures where you have quite a bit of steel going in both directions. You may get plastic shrinkage cracking that's randomly oriented. Okay, we'll take two more questions. The first, what is fogging? Oh, sure, I can take this one. So fogging okay. is um, it's basically misting the concrete with um, mist or you know fog, water droplets, um, to prevent, again, the surface from drying out. So you really, to prevent cracking, um, if you're maybe not using other curing mechanisms or you're, you're um, using this in addition to curing, but you know, with the low humidity days for exterior placements, you may fog the surface repeatedly as the concrete is curing, again, to prevent that surface from drying out and, and make sure that that cement has enough water on the surface to hydrate and give you a durable surface to your concrete. Final question. How do you treat cracks early on so they do not become a bigger problem later or a bigger problem structurally? So this could likely be a whole webinar in and of itself. <laughs> um, so I'll try to answer as succinctly as possible. Um, but there are certain crack widths that you really start worrying about um, moisture migration, 
potentially chloride migration, um, anything that can get into the body of the concrete. And so things like routing and sealing cracks can be a very effective way if they get to a certain size to um, treat a crack so you can't get that infiltration of those materials that then may lead to other distress mechanisms or a more advanced rate of deterioration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Daniela. And thank you all for joining us. We hope it's been educational. As a reminder, you'll receive an email with a link to an on-demand version of this webinar that you can use to rewatch the presentation at your convenience. And that on-demand link will also give you access to, to all of the related resources that you see on the right side of your screen, uh, including a PDF copy of the presentation, as well as a link to download your certificate of completion. And finally, there's a teal icon at the bottom of your screen that will open up a very brief survey about today's webinar, uh, including an opportunity to suggest future WJE webinar topics We'd really appreciate it if you take one moment to fill out that survey. All feedback is welcome. If you have any other questions about uh, the presentation content today, please reach out to Daniela or Carla. They'd be happy to answer your questions. And if you have any questions about WJE webinars, uh, please contact me, Liz Pemper, at lpemper at wje.com. So again, thank you all so much for your time, and we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.